Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. On behalf of Avid Learning, welcome to an everlasting imprint celebrating Raja Ravi Varma's Bombay connection. Raja Ravi Varma was a trailblazer, a pioneer who broke new ground in the realm of art. While his portraits garnered him fame and, from, and patrons, both the, from the Indian nobility and the European community in India, Varma's artistic journey didn't stop there. His journey expanded into Indian mythology, immortalizing the stories of Hindu gods and goddesses, as well as characters from the epics and the Puranas. However, Raja Ravi Varma's impact extended way beyond his artistry. He brought about a revolution in Indian art. In 1894, he established a lithographic press in Bombay, enabling mass production of copies of his paintings and oleographs. This ingenious innovation made his art accessible to ordinary people, democratizing the world of art and creating a lasting influence on popular Indian culture. At Avid Learning, we have long been enamored by the artistry of Raja Ravi Varma. In one of our earlier events, Visual Cultures of Kitsch in India, we trace the extraordinary journey of Raja Ravi Varma in building a unique Indian visual culture that laid down enduring templates for Indian art, design, photography, cinematic illusions, and bizarre prints, resonating with creativity and influence across ages and generations. This brings me to today's event, which was guided by two reasons. One, being the launch of Ganesh V. Shivaswami's second volume of the six-part masterpiece, Raja Ravi Varma, an everlasting imprint. And second, to dwell deep into Raja Ravi Varma's significant relationship with the city of Bombay and its lasting legacy. We start the evening's proceedings with uh, art historian, and writer Dr. Firoza Godridge officially launching the book, which will be followed by an extremely engaging conversation between advocate and author Ganesh B. Shivaswamy and founder director archiving services Dipti Shasidharan. At Avid Learning, we strongly believe in collaboration and a special thanks to Pandols, Dadiba, Korshet, Priya, Tanya for hosting us here tonight and always, always supporting us in everything we do at Avid. Now to commence the, e the special evening with the launch of the second volume of Raja Ravi Varma, an everlasting implant, please put your hands together and welcome, I would have said on stage, but welcome in front, uh, Dr. Firoza Godridge, <laughs> Ganesh Shivaswamy, Dipti Sasidharan, Rama Varma Thampuran of Kilimanur, Brijeshwari Kumari Gohil, Sharan Aparao, Ashwat Narod, Dadiba Pandol, Dadiba coming, and Mrs. Madhuruya. Um, Dr. Godridge, to say a few words. It's fatal to ask me to say a few words, but uh, firstly, let me thank uh, Avid, Asad, Pandol, and everyone connected with the publication. And I'm really honored to have done this. Uh, as I entered, I told uh, Asad, I'm not the Ravi Varma scholar, but one has read a lot about him, appreciated what he's done for contemporary art, actually, because he brought it down to the masses, and he lived with the aristocracy, and I'm delighted there are descendants of the Ravi Varma family here with us this evening. That's a double honor for us in Mumbai. It's uh, been a long journey for Ravi Varma, 175 years since his birth, exactly, and we should have many more celebrations to commemorate this genius. He really was a genius. He was a prince amongst painters, but he had the common touch, to use a cliche. And it's because of him, controversial or not, I'm not that's not the subject today. We're going to hear that, hear that from the scholars over here in the discussion. He left his mark on contemporary art in India, 
And this was at the time when we were under British rule and he had a struggle. He could not see the master artist who was working in the palace at Travancore. Uh, he was not allowed to observe him. He was not allowed to share the secrets of pigmentation, but he overcame it all. And uh, if you Google him or if you're interested in him, there are several biographies and he has several firsts to his credit. And we're going, looking forward to hearing about it. I congratulate uh, Dr. Uh, Shivaswamy for the second volume and definitely looking forward to the other four, five, and six. And I hope that you'll be, uh, I know it's going to be a smashing hit. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Ravi Varma's paintings uh, have gone through the ceiling price-wise. So we are very fortunate by this book because for me, this is as far as it will go now. And I remember the auction years ago in Bombay. It was the first auction. And I won't forget the painting. And I know who was bidding for it. It was a furious bidder. And we were amateurs in those days, Dadiba, taking bids on telephones and great excitement. And it was the Begum's Bath. Beautiful painting. It, was, it is a national treasure. It's still with the family that bid for it. And you should have heard the, wow, <gasps> when the hammer went down, only 38 lakhs. <laughs> but it was a lot of money in those days. I wouldn't divulge anymore. So thank you very much for giving us this treasure. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the conversation uh, between you and my dear friend, Dipti Shashidharan. So, Asad, thank you. I've kept it short. Enjoy the evening, and do get a copy of the book. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Ganesh. Thank you. Welcome to Welcome to the city of uh, Bombay. You've landed bang in the middle of lots of cricket, lots of art. And yet we were able to match them out. Look at the crowd. <laughs> yeah, extraordinary. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Um, we are surrounded very much in spirit and the, in uh, the presence of Ravi Varma here. There's fabulous works of art by Ravi Varma on the walls around. We have members of the family. Thank you for coming all the way. Um, and of course, we are joined today by Ganesh, who is on the second edition of his magnum opus on Ravi Varma. And so I'm going to start this conversation with a very simple question. Um, Ganesh, how did you come to six volumes on Ravi Varma? Actually, the, the reason why six volumes, this is something which people have often asked me, as to why is it six volumes, others have just written one. Uh, I think one of the reasons is because, um, and I've had reporters come up to me and they say, can you tell us in three lines what's different? <laughs> it's almost impossible to do it. But I think, let me give it a try. I think one of the reasons why it gets into six volumes is because I look at Ravi Verma in context rather than explore him in isolation. Till now, people have only spoken about the artist. But if you actually look at Ravi Verma in a larger context, how did he make the image? These are people who helped in the image building process, the models, the photography, the various influences which get into it. This is before Ravi Verma. And then you look at what Ravi Verma does with the influences. He picks up bits and pieces from everywhere, goes on to create an image. And then we look at step three, which is when the image is actually propelled into the public uh, realm through the Ravi Verma press, the agency of the Ravi Verma press. And then stage four, you look at what happens once it becomes a chromolithograph, how people absorb it, how people repel it, criticize it, appreciate it. So every picture, so the, in my series, the picture is the protagonist. It's not really the artist. So when you look at four stages for every picture, you look at Ravi Verma in the larger context of a before and after, and it's because of that it goes from one to six. Thank you. It's fun always talking to Ganesh because in his head there is a deck of like 10,000 images of Ravi Verma. <laughs> And so he's speaking, but we um, begin our conversation today in stage three, which is when Ravi Verma, who was already, he was born in 1848, um, he built his, uh, his career and 
renown. But a seminal moment came when he decides to um, adopt technology and actually establish a printing press. The printing press was established in Bombay, um, which was those days the crossroads of everything that came from India and went from, uh, to, from here to the world. Um, they, we'll, we'll be talking and looking at some images. I coaxed Ganesh to um, pull up some images for us so that all of us can also look at uh, the um, specifics of what he's talking about. So Ganesh, shall we uh, begin so, with the um, we're looking at how Ravi Verma actually landed up in Bombay. So let's look at Ravi Verma and Bombay initially before we actually do a deep dive into volume two. Interestingly, what happened is if you, if you look at Ravi Verma's larger legacy, his uh, association with places like Baroda and Mysore, Travancore, Madras, Pudukote, these are all very regimented, structured. You know that they were there was one Maharaja in Baroda, two in Mysore, three in Travancore. You can sort of structure it. But with, with Bombay, it's a big mishmash of things because every time he goes from north to south, south to north, he parks himself here. And something or the other happens to him. But interestingly, if you look at a city which is so haphazard and Ravi Verma, there are actually a lot of, there are a lot of letters uh, associating Ravi Verma with Bombay. Even before Ravi Verma lands into Bombay, you have a letter. This is in the um, Baroda State Archives. What Ravi Verma has actually done is he's exhibited this painting called the Nair Lady Tuning the Fiddle at the Pune Art Society exhibition. And the governor of Bombay, James Ferguson, at that point of time, wants a copy of it. So he writes all the way to Madhav Rao, who is the Divan of uh, Baroda at that time, and says, who is this artist? Please let me know. We want a copy. And this is actually Madhav Rao's reply to Ravi Verma by saying, you can expect a call from the military secretary of uh, the governor of Bombay, James Ferguson. What happens is Ravi Verma's reputation actually arrives before he actually does. And you have In the city, yeah. both of the copies here. Now, what is interesting about the copies is it's this demand for copies, which eventually results in the creation of the Ravi Verma press. And interestingly, with Ravi Verma, we also have the actual telegram of when he first arrives in Bombay. And ladies and gentlemen, it's November 1881, and we are here again in November talking about Ravi Verma. This is the, uh, this is the telegram, of course, which he sends to Madhav Rao saying, I start kindly make arrangements for me at Bombay. Just go back to the, one of the copies. So just a little bit of context for those here. You have to remember, I'm going to take you back a good 200 years. Um, and there was a time when it was simply not possible to have a copy. Till photography came in 1838, it was simply not possible to have a copy of something of great beauty unless you could commission or request someone to make a quick sketch of it. The period from 1838, and, and Ravi Varma was born just 10 years later, his entire career was uh, uh, running parallel to when photography and the ability to copy, mass copy, anything really was sweeping across the major cities of the world. You had postcards in 1880s where we are right now when this telegram is being sent. You had postcards by the thousands that were floating across the world. The postcards carried images of exotic places, they carried images of beautiful lands, then they carried images of places where nobody had ever been. Into that milieu, Ravi Varma grows into his own as an artist and he's painting these beautiful works. And as Ganesh just said, it's the who's who who's asking him or has at least are able to ask, can you but make me a copy? Um, as early as, and you can, the Maharaja of Baroda, the uh, pieces that were commissioned for the Gaikwad house, uh, the fame spread far and wide and people wanted to come and take away photographs of these beautiful images. And therefore, we come now to the printing press. So tell us a bit about yeah. that. So leading up to the printing press, Ravi Verma started sending, now this is one of the paintings which is in the Royal Gaikwad collection in Baroda. And it was painted in Kilimanjaro. It was first exhibited in Trivandrum. And then it comes to Bombay and it's exhibited with the Bombay Art Society exhibition. Uh, so the entire series which you see today in Baroda 
was actually exhibited here first. And uh, you have a newspaper clipping of it, the Bombay Gazette. Uh, Bombay Gazette reported it. The Times of India was heavily reporting Raja Ravi Verma. And if you look at newspapers and their fascination with Ravi Verma, there were two newspapers which led it. One was Times of India in Bom Bombay, the Bombay Gazette, and the other one was Hindu in uh, Chennai. All of these three people were heavily reporting Ravi Verma. Every time he came here, went there, he arrived, he's left. All of that finds a place in all of these newspapers. He was quite the celebrity. And what happens is, uh, this is the second time there's this impulse, this impetus for Ravi Verma to now make copies. Because when this exhibition takes place here, there is another public demand. And uh, this is in 1890, this is the Hindu. And it says, a correspondent writes from yesterday's issue, it would appear the celebrated artist, Mr. Ravi Verma Koltambaran, has drawn several highly admirable pictures intended to adorn the palace of His Highness the Gaikwad of Baroda. It would be useful if the learned artist would have pictures photographed and sold. So what really happens is even before the press starts, there are a whole series of photographs which come out. And this is a very interesting dimension to uh, the spread of, even, this is just before the Ravi Verma press. Yeah, and I think the fact that Ravi Verma, as uh, Ganesh mentioned at the time, he's one of the few artists who's had the privilege, definitely um, his royal background and his ability to uh, mix with his patrons gave him the advantage of being able to travel to most of the princely states uh, where he was also actively uh, pursuing patrons or commissions. Um, so I want to bring up, I spoke a little earlier about photography coming in and uh, you must remember Bombay at the time, it's, it's fascinating that we are sitting here in Ballad Estate and Literally in a five to ten minutes taxi drive, we can go to all these places, scenes of action that you see in the, in the story that you're telling. The Raja Deen Dayal Studios, the famous, they were located on DN Road, which was not far away. Raja Deen Dayal had this fabulous um, glass house on the top, on, the, on his roof. And this glass house, house had smoked glass. And what did this enable? It enabled you to take portraits with no shadows on your face. And uh, um, a century and more later, we are still trying to do the same thing, I think. <laughs> but Ravi Verma's photographs were, um, uh, were uh, going, both of royalty as well as of common people, were widely acknowledged and very much in demand. And one of the things that the photographic houses very quickly started doing was dressing up uh, young models in evocative poses. They were setting up, they were um, dressing young girls as goddesses and really whoever your, your imagination could conjure up. And it's against this background that Ravi Verma, who's traveling between cities and seeing it, comes up with this very novel um, idea that perhaps I too should, anyway, people are asking me for co copies, but that there is now a case for me to be able to make replicas. So the Ravi Verma Press begins, 1894. This is a rare photograph. And if you look very closely, at the left it says, Office, the Ravi Verma Fine Art Litho Press, um, Agents A.K. Joshi. Interestingly, we do, I don't know where it is in Bombay, but this is the photograph of the Ravi Verma Press in Bombay. There are, in volume two, you will actually see a number of locations as candidates. One says Proctor we Road. We tried to do some <laughs> sleuthing. So to all the uh, Bombay citizens here, if you can identify the facade of this building, for which you'll have to buy the book, <laughs> we'd be very grateful. <laughs> so this is where the Ravi Verma Press began. Um, I, as I said, multiple locations. What Volume 2 does is it actually gets into telling you who owned the Ravi Verma Press. For the longest time, everyone thought Ravi Verma owned the Ravi Verma Press. Ravi Verma never owned the Ravi Verma Press. Uh, the press was started as a partnership with his brother, C. Raja Raja Verma and Govardhan Das Katao Makanji of the Katao Mills. Uh, then uh, Katao exits the partnership because he finds that the press is not viable, financially viable. C. Raja Raja Verma, who is his brother, owns it briefly until it's sold to Fritz Leihe. Fritz Leihe is the German who actually comes down from Germany to set it up. 
it is through fritz like here that the press attains great fame and becomes financially immensely lucrative we also know fritz like here executed a will in 1930s and in 1930s the amount of money he bequeathed to his family would have made him a millionaire in today's That's terms considerable yeah. Yeah, yeah huge amount of money and what it says uh, which we'll come to in a bit uh this volume also has the price lists which you're going to show you and you can actually make uh, an assessment of how the prices come down and yet fritz like here's fortune goes up which only means that the prints were being sold and bought in huge numbers so i mean if at all if you look at it from a commercial angle uh democratization really was achieved through the river mapres in fact the book outlines all these layers very clearly so for those of you interested in the history of art selling this is a quite a uh, eye in the sky perspective because um, ganesh picks up the nuances like he said raja raja verma is the uh, the 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 print is started in ravi verma's name and it carried the name almost till it died out in 1980s the proprietor is his brother raja raja verma but the people who finally come to own it were not even indians or not particularly invested in anything that ravi verma painted they the business drove the printing press and um, that's one layer the second layer is of how prices when the first prints were launched they were launched at i think 6 rupees a print which was a steep amount of money um, a good 120 years ago but at the same time the prices like he rightly said the prices dip but the volume of sales explodes so it's a fascinating study into how one genre that we don't even consider in all seriousness of how availability really drives the business in fact um, the book also gets into the politics of that time yeah, um one uh, fritz like here the german who buys it he gives a press interview in germany in 1906 just before ravi verma dies of course he's in germany at that time and he says one of the reasons why my press is doing really well is because i'm a german yeah. at that time he says that the that the locals hated the british so much that they were buying german products only to irritate the british and if you look carefully at prints uh, uh, you know if you look at that there some of these prints actually bootlegged it and said printed as german that was the reason is because everybody they knew just put german the print will sell so <laughs> that was actually what was going on so this kind of political dynamic is also looked into in the volume uh this is the announcement of the first first chromolithograph july 12 1894 and that's the first one you have to tell the audience the nuances of a chromo lithograph okay so um three words <laughs> what this is this is a chromo lithograph so a whole bunch of people call it all kinds of things uh it is done through the process of lithography uh and if it was made to simulate an oil painting it's an oleograph this does not simulate an oil painting it doesn't have the text it doesn't have the varnish what this is is a chromolithograph which is using the flat stone using multiple shades to print one of these it could have and the volume actually has uh, photographs of the litho stones and the progressive proof prints um, the process of making this is quite explained with specific reference to the ravi verma press thank you i know because a lot of there was one really crazy somebody said it was a chromist made reproduction you actually search for chromist you'll never find the word the closest is chromist star which is algae so you know a lot of lot of fancy that's a whole another world <laughs> i mean these are nuances but you know in a world where digital prints are available anywhere and everywhere the whole process i spoke earlier about replication but whether it was photography or it was printing the process of how these multiple prints were made was also extremely laborious and tedious um and literally like he just said the litho litho is stone so there are these big pieces of stone that were etched and i'm putting it very simply um dipped in uh, printing ink and then that's how you got the chromo or the color on on this so a plate like this would have had what seven or eight different it could stones. have gone all the way up to 24 it's like block printing for those of you who are familiar every color has a separate stone 
So you can just imagine what it would have taken to put the print that you see behind me together. Coming to the price lists. Yeah. Um, the book for the first time, so uh, I'm sure there are lithograph collectors here like I am. Uh, all of us wonder how many pictures actually came out of the Ravi Varma press. We want to catalog them. Uh, we want to know them. Uh, we want to know how much they cost, what were the prices, what were the registration numbers. Uh, till now, we've never actually seen a definitive catalog until volume two. Both of these price lists feature as appendices in the book. Uh, the one on the left is by, and both of them are by the distributors. So one is by Ananta Shivaji Desai Topiwale of Bombay, Moti Bazar Bombay. This is 1913. You have to tell the Topiwale story. So apparently he made a lot of money selling caps. Uh, and he uh, uh, <laughs> acquires the honorific of Topiwale. Uh, and then he becomes a distributor of the Ravi Varma Press. And the one on the right is uh, again by the Ravi Varma Press Picture Depot. It's actually a distributor. It's not the actual press. So for those of you all who see the bottom of the print, which says Ravi Varma Press on the right, and it says Ravi Varma Press Picture Depot on the left, the, the Ravi Varma Press Picture Depot is the distributor and had a separate set of ownership. It was in a different location. Of course, was distributing Ravi Varmas. Both of the one on the left is 1913. The one on the right is 1928. How do we know that? Is because it was posted to somebody and you see the postal mark which is 1928. Both of the price lists are featured in the book. So for the first, for lithograph collectors, you have to get this volume. So you can catalog your collection and know how much it, uh, um, what sizes. It's and what a key. But also to, uh, talk to us about how the distributors also became immensely wealthy. So the distributors, of course, they caught on to something which was really uh, 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 great business. There were people who were picking up uh, again in the interview in 1906. Uh, Fritz Leher says he had distributors way out in Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, the prints were going all the way over there. The distribution network was really very sort of sorted, sorted and oiled. It worked really well uh, and was largely uh, taken care of by the railway. So for those of you who see at the bottom of the print, which says GIP, that's the great, uh, the Indian, Indian Peninsula Railway. railway. Uh, because the press only had that address, the railway station. Yeah, one of the interesting things is how many um, streams and events that were happening in the world at that time come together in the book. The expansion of the railways and very smartly the German entrepreneur puts the press next to the uh, railway line. In fact, I think he goes and... Um, he actively contributes towards making the local station and so on. We'll talk about that a bit later. But also, this is also the time when hundreds of um, uh, Indians are migrating, what, like he said, to East Africa. And every migrant person who left on a ship wanted to take their God with them. So I hope you get to understand the scale of what this man and this printing press were able to take everywhere. I'm cross-examining a lawyer. <laughs> So I had to, we had to bring in uh, one image of uh, um, a litigation going on. It's a fascinating story, and I'll let the author speak about it. So all of you all have seen Rangrasia, the movie? It didn't happen. Okay, so I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> so I'll tell you what actually happened. 18, uh, end of 1894, early 1895, Ravi Varma, C. Raja Raja Varma, land up in Bombay. Uh, chaperoning Prince Martanda Varma through his tour of uh, North India. There's a wonderful travelogue which uh, C. Raja Raja Varma writes. And he says that they were at the Baikula Club. And they met Justice John Jardine and Justice Ranade. And they say, please come to the High Court and take a look at how, you know, in those days they were very deferential to uh, royalty and this, that. And, and there's an excerpt in the uh, in Siraj Rajavarma's travelogue and he says, uh, we went into the court, the prince was given a seat between the judges and they were hearing a case of a very interesting nature. And what was it? A Pune art dealer was, uh, had appealed because there was an, uh, he was accused of selling obscene pictures. <laughs> and the court deliberates over it and decides to embark on an inquiry as to, and it was of a girl coming out of the bath. Uh, and they decided to embark on an inquiry as to whether the girl, the, the 
the sort of the form of the girl could be construed as a classical beauty in which case it's not obscene <laughs> or not so they look at the girl and they say ha ah, you know beautiful classical beauty fine but silk and umbrella and her inner unmentionables are hanging on the tree so it's obscene so i was like really did this case happen and i went into the law reports and i actually found yeah the case actually happened just as john jardine and just as ranade sent this guy off into the cooler because there was a silk and umbrella hanging on the picture <laughs> ravi verma was not the accused because we know who the accused is and it's mentioned in volume 2 it's somebody else i have given you the reference because i don't want uh, rangrasia yes, person running after me it's okay can <laughs> run after me <laughs> i've actually given you the citation of the actual judgment which took place and it said that yeah off you go to the cooler because there's a silk and umbrella hanging on the picture i mean in a way when uh, ganesh and i was speaking about this it's fascinating that artists um, even today are still fighting the same battles if you paint a nude is it a classical beauty is it uh, is it okay um, or if you like he said there are elements of uh, either eroticism or uh, uh how do i put it seductive nuances then you may be hauled to court you know but i'll tell you uh, before when i came to this segment uh what i actually did was i said um, let's ask people what they think is obscene today so this was in 2021 when this sec- section of the book was being written so i sent out sms uh, whatsapp messages to a whole bunch of people various age groups i said what do you think is obscene today what do you what how would you define obscenity i'll tell you the only consistent answer which i got was inconsistency <laughs> it varied by age it varied depending on where the person was it depended on whether the person was you know from a more traditional family a more modern family a more traditional location modern location but even within the family the father would say something the son would happily say nothing is obscene i'm sure ravi verma also faced the same things because he had considerable scrutiny in the palace as well he see but i'll tell you let me just finish my thought and then i realized that obscenity is not just a double standard within those if you think about obscenity if i see a picture and my 6 year old daughter is next to me i will say obscene no 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 don't look at it but the same picture if i see in the privacy of my bedroom i'll say beautiful chick what it means is that the double standard is not based on one person another person yourself you will have a double standard and if you have a double standard in yourself how do you make a policy standard out of it how do you how how do you expect court to draw a line and say this side obscene this side not obscene so this debate is going to continuously keep going on there's no doubt of it at all don't think this is going to end it will never end in fact there's an interesting anecdote which features in volume 4 or 5 when the british government decided to rework the education policy in india so there's a beautiful file in the archives and one line caught by fancy it says to place the indian epics before the indian public is as bad as placing the arabian nights before an english domestic circle imagine the standard which was which has been imposed on us till today where we look at obscenity from a victorian standpoint this is correct yeah and this ripple which was thrown in into the this stone which was thrown into the pool in 1877 we still not come out of even today we don't know what obscenity is in, in fact i think you cover that in volume 1 where ravi verma has given a photograph like ganesh showed a little earlier of his royal patrons and um, and he has to paint in i mean there's an assorted checklist from velvet blouses uh to uh, garments that cover specific parts of the body each of these come together because of the victorian morality and like uh, ganesh said the increasing standards of what was proper that was seeping the um country at the time let's go on the ravi verma press printed amar chitra katha yes um a lot of work very good work has been done as to how ravi verma's 
image influenced the amar chitra katha image dr carlin mclean has written extensively about it uh, and how uh, amar chitra katha also modifies it absolutely uh, so um, carlin mclean has actually goes on to say that the amar chitra katha woman was actually far more scantily clad yeah. than the ravi verma woman but there was no objection to the amar chitra katha especially since it's placed before children yeah. uh but that that of course we know but what the discovery is this is a progressive proof print of aladdin and the lamp or something like or one of those comics in uh, the uh, hastashilpa trust so we know that the ravi verma press actually printed the amar chitra katha comic and uh, i found this little uh, you know um, the aladdin and the lamp the orders so we know hindi so much marathi so much we actually somehow know now which which one was actually more demanded than the other i like gujarati is written the malayalam way with the h i <laughs> ah, all of them seem to be you no know, marathi gujarati yeah. <laughs> yeah um for those of you who who have read amar chitrakatha or have read uh, you know the classics urvashi meera if visuals spring to your mind you'll say that there were these nymphs that are flying scantily clad the apsaras are coming down you know and uh, there's a lot of rapture and 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 really borderline uh, uh, eroticism and the inspiration for many of these silhouettes was of course derived from the prints that came from the ravi verma lithographic prints um a host of uh, beautiful indian women uh, the, we can name some of them padmavati varini uh, the uh, all of them these prints were the prints didn't have the name but the seasons for example um uh, padmini uh, vasantika and varini vasantika and varini you know the the um british homes of refined taste had rooms where usually the four seasons were depicted these would often take the uh, shape of sometimes marble statues sometimes there were they were garden furniture sometimes there were paintings on the wall uh, but we of course the ravi verma press and our astute german took it a step further and made it into prints with indian names and indian protagonists i want to actually carry on this comic culture thing because that's also dealt with in the book taking comic culture and satire into their ravi verma memes instagram uh, that's also featured in the book because this is a continuation of what is happening in the digital space i find it very interesting i i am not going to be judgmental but i'm going to say it that today for you to have a meme on instagram which is catered to the younger generation actually people take great offense to it you will see some of the comments and there'll be people saying you know how could you do it it's sacrilege to a ravi verma picture so somehow today if you look at the satire and its association with ravi verma what is what is certainly there is that somehow ravi verma has attained sanctity and sanctity today at one point of time it was heavily criticized but today if you look at the instagram i i follow it very diligently this huge objection today you can't associate ravi verma with satire although ravi verma was being associated with satire as early as 1897 when uh, the hindi punch you have all of that from volume 3 onwards hindi punch used to use ravi verma's pictures for all kinds of comics that time it was fine but today somehow we, i don't know i i'm very interested to Uh, realize how that alteration in dynamic has taken this is place. true because any image that springs to our mind um whether it is of let's take the well known ones of saraswati or lakshmi the silhouettes of how we worship them how they are crafted into any form uh, whether it is in, in sculptures whether they are woven textile everything traces its roots back to these early iterations that were done by ravi verma as paintings and then spread all over the world as prints What's also interesting is of course that subsequent artists and uh, uh contemporaries of his time also continued the same sort of form. You want to talk to us a little bit about that? Let's go on to the next. I think that comes in the Yes. Let's look at the uh, let's look at the expansive work of the Ravi Verma press before we actually get in. The Ravi Verma press um actually engaged other artists to also paint for the press. M V Durandar. In fact, Volume Two has a letter written by the press to Durandar saying, "Please come and paint for us." And the one which you see on the left is a progressive proof print. And if you carefully look at the signature at the bottom, it goes as far as Ambika Durandar. Ambika Durandar. Um, so uh, 
this is one and the one on the right is an artist called k madhavan now these are people uh, now i'm going to tell you what happens because these people paint for the press is in the general uh, understanding all of these are ravi varma mm. pictures and what technically happens is they all fall under the shadow of ravi varma which is in a sense unfortunate for them so we have to start talking about these artists as well they contributed simply because it came from the ravi varma press they were not by ravi varma they were by other artists so volume 2 starts talking about these artists as well ambika durandar i just want to talk to you about the one on the right i'm sure none of you all have heard of k madhavan or very few of you all have heard of k madhavan k madhavan was from trivandrum goes on to madras and he paints extensively for the covers of uh, vernacular magazines ananda vikata noma this that and the other and for the cinema industry the lobby cards so much so so prolific apparently was he that steven inglis refers to him as the norman rockwell of south india he was so famous during his time but today no one is talking about him and these are the artists we should now again start talking about because they had lives of their own and immensely contributed to popular culture at that point of time all of these people durandar k madhavan k s siddhalinga swami the whole bunch of them are listed as many as we could now the reason why we are able to do this is because the ravi varma press allowed them to put imprints of signatures which the earlier presses did not do so in that sense i think ravi varma press was a little more all right you know for things yeah, that was a bit of a discovery for me in the book that somehow in your head which is wrong i realized that the ravi varma press i always thought ran under the the um, uh, sponsorship of a ravi varma authority but that's not true uh, both the brothers uh, ravi varma less so and raja raja varma they gi- he gives up his proprietorship and then other than the name there really isn't anything to connect it back to either the artist or his uh, style of painting which of course continued for a a, a bit more in other um, um areas again covered in another um, yeah, yeah. Uh, see but that is that is why i started by saying i'm looking at ravi varma in context because a relay race is not won by one exactly and so is the ravi varma legacy it ravi varma died in 1906 but the press continues till 1980 so certainly ravi varma would have had nothing to do with it but that's how legacies are built that's how brands are built we have many many institutions and businesses started by one but carried on by so many and that's exactly how the ravi varma press also continued so uh, while we do talk about ravi varma it's time to also talk about those people who also ran the relay race and to take it on further is yeah. now your <laughs> it's not, no it's not mine it's very much bombay's uh, they say where ravi varma stopped um, film began did i get that right Absolutely. uh the earliest now we are moving into the 1920s 30s when moving images comes to india it comes to the world and it comes to india the very first uh, moving images of india were as you can imagine all largely based around mythological themes they were based around gods and goddesses they were based around um, um ideas that were easily acceptable uh the earliest moving image cinema also for those of you uh, familiar with film history did not have voice overs there was live music so there were of course limitations um but we we come here to um dada saab phalke and ganesh so um there has been of course people knew that he was inspired by uh, ravi varma and briefly worked at the ravi varma press also but here is actual evidence of a lobby card and if you put one against the other which is what i've done in the book is you see how exact the composition is the way in which uh, parvati is looking up the way in which and of course ganga is very condescendingly descending um uh, so uh, here is evidence so if you've lost the movie we at least have the lobby card to say that there is a definite uh, and this descent of a woman from the heavens which is of course a very um, indian theme is also picked up by artists like sm pandit Correct. and of course like he said the relay moves on in other directions which we can speak about another time we are speaking about it in the next slide okay <laughs> yeah but so but not not the dis- descending uh, not the descending okay maybe the ascending <laughs> <laughs> so the one on the left is sm pandit 
and is considered again by uh, academicians to be the true successor to Ravi Varma. SM Pandit born in Gulbarga and there are many artists like this. I, I spoke of Madhavan, I'm now speaking of SM Pandit. Uh, set up a studio in Shivaji Park in Bombay and uh, uh, again starts painting for films. So it starts with films, goes by. So films and art now are in a sort of blender together. And uh, they're working together, they're being choreographed together and the artists are doing it. Uh, the one on the right is from Film India and is actually signed Studio SM Pandit. But the, uh, according to, again, academicians, they say that the Studio SM Pandit was by another Bombay artist called Raghuvir Mulgankar. And Raghuvir Mulgankar's works now are being uh, sort of brought back into the scene and people are talking about it. And uh, people are analyzing both SM Pandit and Raghuvir Mulgankar uh, both of their works, all of them who can trace it back all the way to Raja Ravi Varma. And again, we have Film India and uh, you know, the other thing which I, I, Deepthi, is the vernacular magazine. The vernacular magazine is something people should now begin to research. Uh, it's a very interesting concept. There was a talk by somebody, Ambika Patelji in Baroda, where she's she showed this illustration from a vernacular magazine of Raghavir Malukankar, very erotic. And uh, I asked her, how do you think people reacted to it? Because the vernacular magazine positions itself exactly into the middle class. And the middle class were uh, the champions of high morality. Even today, you know, you'll have a middle class come up to you and say, we Supposedly. don't have... Supposedly. Uh, okay. <laughs> They'll come up to you and say, we don't have the money of the rich people, so we can't do it. But, you know, we sort of are very demure. And how was the vernacular magazine received by the middle class, especially when it came to images which were um, erotic or evocative? I really want to know. I, I hope some people start now researching the vernacular magazine. So I'm going to share a personal story here. When I was young, I remember the day after Diwali which used to be a way more smoky affair, affair when I was young. Um, all the firecracker boxes would have uh, pictures that were very similar to those that are behind me. These scantily clad women and, you know, I don't know what was going on. And I still remember the milkman. This is a random memory, maybe because I didn't understand. And the next day morning, I found the milkman tearing off all these... Uh, <laughs> firecracker covers and he had a small bag into which he was stuffing it in and I was too little maybe eight nine but the memory stands out and I asked him why are you stuffing this and he looked absolutely bewildered and embarrassed and scooted away uh -huh. but of course many years later I understand why and uh, why were there funny women in it of course there were funny ah, women no. funny <laughs> women you could dream about at night but yeah. but again looking very <laughs> very very similar to to some of the styles i would say that was started yeah. um, by these printing presses that was the whole idea that if you were alone and you wanted to decorate your room you had a print correct so, you know, this is the social dynamic which actually the volumes talk about. It talks about what happens when the pictures get into the spaces of the common men. Uh, patrons have been extensively examined. But what about the common man? How is the common man reacting to art? How is art reacting to the common man? And this is what the actual six volumes... I think it opens up a lot of newer avenues for younger researchers to go look at. Yeah, uh, as I told you, the vernacular magazine is something which everybody should look into before they get destroyed. And I think most of them are already gone. Uh, you know, catalog them. Who were the artists who were commissioned? Who was telling them, paint this, paint that? painted this way, were there some pictures which were rejected because they were obscene or inappropriate? Um, you know, this dynamic, I think... And some they made it everywhere to the, to, um, to the illustrations on beauty products, to little magazines, to uh, packaging of biscuits, tins in which various goods were uh, sent, were all artists that you see that came from these presses. Advertisements. So um, I spoke for Sharon uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, for the Chennai International Center and the topic was advertisement. Um, I actually stood up and I said, you know, I stand before all of you all with great trepidation. 
because i'm speaking about that aspect of the legacy which got ravi verma into great criticism calling him a calendar artist a person who contributed to kitsch so i, I said you know i start with fear lawyer um but let's reexamine the legacy and look at it from today's standpoint and that's what volume 2 does uh, uh it actually goes back into the history of pictures being used for advertisements and it actually happened in europe with the painting called bubbles which was used for a pear soap ad yeah absolutely and then europe they picks it up in a big way you have um, henry to lose lotrek whose posters are being used as advertising and then by the 90 late 1920s and 1930 ravi verma start getting used for advertising by this time ravi verma's dead so ravi verma had no direct association with the images being used for advertising so this is one distinction which has been done the second is to actually look at advertising in a more pragmatic way uh, advertising today if you didn't have advertising most of our businesses will simply collapse advertising is the backbone of keeping uh, for funds to come in for salaries to be paid for um, to sell your product to sell your product for innovation you need to advertise and today most corporate organizations all corporate organizations have a budget for advertising it is perfectly fine for a company to have an advertise advertising budget it's perfectly fine for henry to lose lotric to use his things none of them were called calendar artists but ravi verma was so i find that double standard a little difficult to accept uh i mean you had aishwarya rai i remember when she was quite young she actually posed for the flat screen of an onida tv mm-hmm. and she says this the the screen Neighbors. of this tv is as flat as her tummy i we don't call aishwarya rai at, an advertising artist or an actress why call ravi verma <laughs> <laughs> interesting point yeah. i think it was also the absence in the early days when uh, i mean feroza you mentioned the early days when ravi verma's canvases first entered the sale rooms and um, i think some of these labels were just slapped on because there was just such an absence of information and and in and in that kind of a background he was just slapped on as a calendar artist i couldn't but help notice which i just saw when it's blown up that the box on the bottom right has actually cherubs uh, the vinolia actual box has uh, some kind of english um uh, cherubs and uh, um flowers going on when the uh, while the actual advertisement is uh, is uh, uh, indian goddess why do you think that happened because i'm presuming the box actually still had the western european packaging so uh, there's a there's a huge huge um analysis of both these i mean posters like this there are three elements one is the central figure the second is the advertisement which you find on top and the third is the calendar strip each one of these had different functions this uh, the one in the center was of course to draw everybody and she was a celebrated figure the lakshmi took on a life of her own so everybody was uh, uh, attracted to her so people would draw in lakshmi was used and this please note when it happens it's 1927 1930 is used to advertise a british product and this was to counter the nationalism which was opposed to british products so here now lakshmi is the brand ambassador for a british product so that political dynamic was also going on at that point in time where you have british products there are a number of these calendars which feature in volume 2 that is the second dynamic of the second element the third element is the calendar strip which i think was the most ingenious aspect of the design is by adding the calendar strip at the bottom you ensure the person in the house viewed it every day so sublimely it gets into you and it turned out to become the perfect advertisement and that's why you know lots of houses have the calendars in fact in south india for a period of time um the you could buy the big poster and the little insert at the bottom could be changed every year that also happened where you just tear it off on a daily basis so the image endures in the home while time goes on and the advertisement they only wanted to advertise there and uh, as an advertisement i thought it was the absolute best thing so this is the last ever reference to the reverma press and this is a uh, time out in bombay yeah so uh, we start in bombay we end in bombay 
Asad is taking a photograph. He says, I didn't know time out started then. I said, I'll show you the slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you look at this little round thing which you have over here, it says editorial office, Ravi Verma, Prisma, Lovely, so and so. And what it actually said is, the city's first complete so and so, so and so will hit out. Be the first to include your message in the. No, what it says is, uh, will hit the newsstands before long. So don't let time run out for you. Unfortunately, time ran out for the press. This is actually the last reference to the Reverma Press 1980s, uh, 82. Uh, and with this, uh, the entire saga of the Reverma Press comes to an end. And what happens is very, very unfortunate because it's in private hands. And um, they, of course, started discarding everything. It had become unfashionable to use. And uh, most of the machinery I'm given to understand was sold away because the scrap, scrap metal value. sells well. But what happened to the stones on which all of them were made? They made a road, they covered drains, and in one particular case, they actually had it to pave a school floor. And um, it, it, the story goes that apparently when the children landed up after the vacation, they saw imprints of Lakshmi Saraswati, etc. And they said, we're not going to put our feet on it. So they took acid and just washed the whole thing off. And this is, this, this is, this is the unfortunate thing about how we're dealing with something which, you know, I, let's do a compare. Uh, she's going to kill me, but it's okay. She's here to call. <laughs> she's here to cross-examine me. If you look at an artist, any artist, and you look at Ravi Verma, there is a compare which is possible. Artists contributed to culture. Immensely contributed to culture. True. But the way in which Ravi Verma's influence is so exponential that today you have an auto rickshaw driver having this little print, knows it's a Lakshmi, comes from the Ravi Verma mold. Can it be argued that while other artists were contributed to culture, Ravi Verma contributed to a civilization. Because it goes on to completely alter the entire scape. And finally, this institution which has contributed to a, a civilizational contribution lands up like this. Is this how we are going to deal with other things? And finally, of course, is the last slide of the series is it lands up in the Hastashilpa Heritage Village. Whatever is left of it lands up in the Hastashilpa Heritage Village and that is where most of the archival material for Volume 2 comes. But they had the remnants, they had the scraps, they had the dregs of the bottle. Um, and this is the photograph of me there. I have to tell you this, uh, in the six volume series, no, I like Alfred Hitchcock, apparently he appeared, <laughs> I wanted to appear in one image. Uh, I think so this, this is the image in volume I two, like Alfred Hitchcock, it. I walk through in one of them. So you also <laughs> get this image if you buy the book. <laughs> And this is where now the remnants of the Reverma Press is. No, that's absolutely fa fascinating. And while you continue to think about uh, Ganesh's uh, words, I'm going to open the room up for some questions because I can see lots of things. Please. My name is Anand. A uh, quick comment and a question. The comment is that the American President Reagan had a government uh, study done apparently, and that finally said pornography is only something that you can know when you see it, but you can't define it in context to your obscenity thing. The question is about the, the women in the Ravi Verma paintings. Uh, they came from a particular area where he came from, am I correct? They all have a similar type. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so for that you'll have to get into volume one. There are multiple influences which Ravi Verma had. Um, and when you talk about Ravi Verma's uh, depiction of uh, women, especially attire, um, Balasai Pant Pratinidhi writes an autobiography uh, published in 1940s. 40s. Um, and in that he says, uh, it seems he asked Ravi Verma, he says, uh, which is the uh, sari which you'd like to drape your women in? And he says the Marathi Navari sari because apparently it's figure hugging, and therefore uh, you know it uh, it accentuated the femme. Uh, 
I think his faces except the portraits were all idealized. They were all idealized. So you can't fit it into a Malayali face or a Baroda face. Um, I see where you're coming from because it's an idealized face. But if you look at all his women, there are, uh, there's every imaginable skin color. There's pink, there's dark skin, there's pink, there's things. There's, um, it's quintessentially the Indian woman in, in attire as well as in accessories and jewelry. Um, that, this is true, uh, but uh, um, I just wanted to add that comment. If I may just continue, volume two has three pictures of collective women. Two by Ravi Varma, the galaxy of musicians and an earlier group of Indian women. For the first time, you get to see the group of Indian women. And prior to that was Ramaswamy Naidu's typical costumes. And I do a compare between all the three pictures. Uh, including delineation of the faces in comparison with an ethnic study. So take a look at that. This is also the time when the idea of India as a nation, while it was still really a twinkle in the eye of the politicians, was coming together. So there are these compositions of women who come from different parts of India, both in their attire as well as in their uh, um, skin colors, body types, so on. But they're all clubbed together in a single picture, as in the galaxy of musicians. Uh, you mentioned the one obscenity case that Ravi Varma faced. Did he have any other legal issues with any of his royal patrons or anyone? No, he didn't have. Uh, in fact, he wasn't uh, the, the, this one with that. But uh, the Ravi Varma, uh, he, the Ravi Varma prince landed into a uh, number of litigations. One of the litigations was the Ravi Varma press uh, landed in. Uh, the, uh, not the Ravi Varma press. I want to be technical here. Was an image of Subramanya. And it was printed by the Ravi Udaya Press. For the first time in volume two, you will know who the owner of the Ravi Udaya Press was. It wasn't Ravi Orma, it was M.A. Joshi. So you get all those details of who these other presses were. There was an interesting newspaper article once the Subramanya Swami thing came out. Actually, that, uh, that ties up with this. Let me, let me just... Um, there was an advertisement in the... Uh, not an advertisement. There was a uh, write, uh, reader's opinion in the Hindu. And it says, I wonder if the painting which formed the exemplar was by the hand of Ravi Varma. If anyone can clarify it, please let me know. And it gets signed, Anti Humbug. The distributor gets furious and sues the Hindu by saying, you please tell us who the writer is. Hindu doesn't reveal it, gets dismissed, goes all the way up to the High Court. When it goes to the High Court of Madras, the who's who lawyers get engaged. A.C. Adam as the barrister, very, very expensive barrister, uh, appears for the distributor. Shivaswami Iyer, the advocate general, appears for Hindu, not this Shivaswami Iyer, some other advocate general Shivaswami Iyer, assisted, if you please, by C.P. Ramaswami Iyer, the Divan of, Tra later on goes on to become the Divan of Travancore. This lands up into a huge, every day it's in the Hindu, long things. And the judge, and this debate, this argument goes on between both of them, and then they say, Listen, how do you say this is not... And then the writer is summoned. He says, I was a friend of Ravi Varma and Ravi Varma wrote to me and in the letter, which gets produced as an exhibit in the case, I don't want to paint Subramanya Swami because he has six faces and I can't get the symmetry of the faces in place. So I refuse to paint Subramanya Swami. This is one thing which he says. Then, of course, major battle goes on. They say, uh, how is it defamation... What did I say? I said the picture is bad. It doesn't mean you are bad. And so there is a whole debate by saying, when you attack the picture, it is disparagement of goods. It's not defamation of character. So most lawyers even today don't know the difference between disparagement of goods and defamation of character. If I say that some picture is bad, I'm talking about the object. I'm not talking about the seller. So it's not defamation of character, it's disparagement of goods. Defamation of character is criminal, disparagement of goods is a civil action. So this is the second thing. Then it gets into, no, but you signed it as anti-humbug. He says, I never signed it humbug, I signed it anti-humbug. <laughs> Finally, the case actually gets dismissed. But what is interesting is, in 2140 pages which I have written, six volumes, there are only two instances 
of the direct intentionality of the artist where the artist speaks his mind most of it is inferential and the artist speaks his mind by saying i'm not painting six faces because i can't accommodate them and then you look at all of ravi varma's works the only one he paints with three faces is this one so in the entire ravi varma scape of works imagine how rare this one is the first thing i did when i came in is i said ha you know this because i know the back story to the three faces but what's also interesting is the intentionality where do you get instances of direct speaking of the mind of the artist you know of course intentionality is this huge dispute and uh, not dispute there multiple dimensions to a death of the author roland barthes who says should the intentionality of the artist or author is that important or is the intentionality of the viewer important or that is a different dynamic but you know that was the first defamation litigation in india and uh, of course was uh, before that was um, in london uh, was the uh, was the painting of um, whistler uh, titled a nocturne in black and gold the following rocket that also got into a huge defamation litigation there in london and followed here yeah. no you spoke about uh, the influences or his influences on the movies like dada saheb phalke was there uh, was there a possibility of him influencing the theater also like there's a lot of resemblance between the sta- yeah. bal gandharva and yeah, yeah. of course uh, the theater sets uh, props backdrops yeah yeah they did billboards for the cinema and uh, you know the in- ravi varma and cinema is a wonderful debate um i'll tell you what happened in 2023 january of course by the time the books had already been written i uh, got this uh, you know whenever ravi varma features in court phone call comes to me i uh, <laughs> i got a random phone call one day and i was having a really bad day in court um this reporter calls me up and then says have you heard of adi purush frankly i hadn't so i asked him okay what is this adi purush then he told me the movie blah 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 this that and the other and it seems there's a there was at that time a petition which had been filed before the supreme court and in the supreme court petition it stated the ideal ravan was that painted by ravi varma it's a it, there's a petition in the supreme court by the way which says it so the reporter phones me up and then he says sir is it true that ravi varma painted the correct ravan and you know uh, uh, friends very dear friends who know me if i'm extremely irritated i become i start joking so i actually replied to him by saying i don't think ravi varma had tea with ravan to know how he looked the satire was completely lost on him so he says sir you tell me do you think that is the correct ravan i said even i have not had tea with ravan to know how he looks <laughs> then this guy gets furious with me he says you're not answering the question i said you're not asking the question he says what is the question i said should an image remain static or fluid if it is static the problem is going to be is 10 headed ravan correct this ravan correct that ravan correct but if it is fluid anything goes no absolutely i think that's a whole lot of talk because i do remember when the early 1930s and in my language the god of the sun it was called balakrishna or something it was under on, on the right of krishna where the royal woman is shown wearing a navadi which um, as a royal woman of that god there are trails behind her and the washer woman the who um, was on the bands playing with the baby krishna all have the navadi worn as the ordinary functional garment women wear it which is like pedal to shoulders up to the knee so i just realized that even small nuances like that in a time when there were no other visual references it borrowed heavily from uh, the visual culture that was floating around so that's what i think yes sir my name is baku uh, three things that uh, double standard education policy of that time and Victorian standpoint on morality. This way to go to the book, because we are talking about the greatest, greatest artist of the world, no, no, Raja Rehovan. Concluding thing, what uh, Madam said about the civilization of culture, which even today, uh, every household 
follows it. How do you see this future? And the change so uh, I, I start the preface of volume one uh, by exploring four or five dynamics. Um, we started with revolution, we go on to industrialization, the, we then move on to democratization, and now we are in the phase of digitization. So uh, considering how powerful digital is, I think it's just going to explode. This is the starting point. I really think it's going to explode with AI. AI. I mean, if you, if you, any of you follow that part of the universe and art universe, you will already find that Ravi Varma and the work of the art is already a reference point from where art, as uh, we begin in the in the digital world, begins. So it's it's already begun and it will endure. At, at least that's my two bits. Yes, because Ravi Varma is far too entrenched in us for you to move away from him any soon. We'll take one last question. Congratulations for the second volume. And thank you for acknowledging the other artists like the the Mari and others. So our question uh, is specific. Uh, you have published this which dates back to 1938. So have you tried to identify how many were done by Ramadan, how many were done by the prints which are based on the I was not able to. I, but what, I'll tell you, the number in relation to Ravi Verma, uh, Chrome, uh, Chromolithographs from the Ravi Verma press, made by Ravi Verma, the number floats between 132 and 134. Now, the reason why I am not able to give you a definitive answer is because, take for example, Ajavila. None of the collectors have seen it. I have not seen it. And I, I've known collectors for a very, very long time. It features in the 1913 list, but none of us have seen the picture. Or take, for example, Ratnavali. It doesn't feature in either of the price lists, evidently, because by 1913, it would have been discontinued. So, there's a, there, is no, and, uh, uh, so there is no definitive answer of how many Ravi Verma becomes chromolithographs in the Ravi Verma press. But I think the estimate would be 132 to 134. Now, when you talk about Dhurandar, huge problem, we can only attack it stylistically. Because very many of them came in the smaller size, they were about that big, and simply did not have signatures. But Dhurandar's works were very similar to A.M. Mali's works, at least from the printing press compare. So you're not able to compare between those two. Uh, some of them I know are by A.M. Mali, some of them I know are by Mueller, uh, uh, and the larger ones which have the imprint of the signature, we know. But exactly how many Dhurandars came... And there were also iterations that went yes. into other printing presses. Yes. So it, it's kind of blur, the line blurs. You do Dhurandar. <laughs> Here at the back of the room, we'll take one last question. And, uh, this question of uh, all these presses getting set up with Ravi uh, Ravi uh, In today's day and age, we also spoke about AI and investigation and uh, duplicating a lot of the work and uh, presenting it to the black public. Uh, how did residuals of all of these work when it comes when it came to any monies or any profits that were generated from the game? Copyright royalty. Yeah. Okay, so again, if you look at volume two, it finally tells you what the copyright issue was. And uh, references to the archives. The issue in relation to copyright on art and engravings became the bone of contention as early as 1850s with the Bombay Bengal Photographic Society making the first petition saying, please bring in copyright insofar as engravings is concerned. Then Ravi Verma writes, Fritz Lai here writes, many people, Chitrashala Press writes, all of these people write to the government, nothing is done. Finally, in 1913, Fritz Lai here gets so angry that he actually files a petition before the Bombay High Court and he says, please copyright because there's bootlegging going on and it's affecting our business. Huh? 1913. And the High Court of Bombay says, no copyright, it belongs to all. The amendment comes in only 1914, by which time Ravi Verma did. So, yes, yeah, so in a way, so the no legacy royalties. belongs to everybody, and yeah. so do the royalties, in a way. Um, so, 
that you mentioned at towards the end that such an celebrated artist uh, being labeled as a calendar artist and it's unfortunate but uh, is that the reason that uh, he reached out to masses through his printing through his all the prints were made and duplicated and uh, everything was available so easily do you think is that the reason that's how um, see when a brand gets established like a celebrity the ravi the ravi varma lakshmi had become a huge brand by so the ravi varma that R lakshmi image gets appropriated as a brand ravi varma as such had nothing to do with it because by the time advertising actually began ravi varma was dead ravi varma died in 1906 but his images get appropriated for advertising calendars etc so uh, to associate ravi varma as a cal as actually wrong that was the argument which was thank you uh, ganesh and dipti for such an engrossing and wonderful conversation about ravi varma his press and mumbai uh, and congratulations to you on volume 2 we look forward to 3 4 5 and 6 um, but um, uh, ganesh will be signing uh, copies of his both his volumes that are published so please do take them uh, thank you to uh, dr firoza godridge for gracing us here and launching this book and to our dear partners the pandols dadiba korshet priya um and tanya for always supporting us uh, we have lots of interesting programs so firstly thank you to the audience for being here not watching cricket so raja ravi varma tops cricket so yeah uh, or art tops cricket um, we have lots of interesting programs coming up um, on the 18th of november that's saturday we have met the wife an evening of music dance and storytelling it's the latest chapter of the courtesan project a series by manjri chaturvedi at the royal opera house on the 28th of november we have evolving clay practices a prelude to common ground indian ceramic triennale 2024 which will be at the bhavdaji lard museum to find out more just check out our website or stalk us on social media thank you once again for coming and please get your copies and let ganesh sign them thank you good night